about neutral networks or manifolds? So I think I gave the title was uh, Living in a Land with Two Times. <laughs> so, um, and I guess when I was thinking about doing it, I was thinking, well, kind of a physical thing. And then I realized, well, you could think about what it's like to live in a land of two times. And then you realize, actually, we kind of do live in a land of two times. So that's what I'm going to try and explain is not what it would be like, but why it is or what, how we can see that what we live in is a land of two times. So um, let me just uh, start with just a simple definition. So if you take, uh, let's think of L over N the set of all oriented lines in Rn. So every oriented line, you think of as a point in this space, and it's not too hard to see that, in fact, this is the tangent bundle to the 2n-2 two two sphere. So there's a reasonably straightforward way that you can see that that's a a uh, manifold of that dimension. Uh, so let's take uh, the sphere, uh, the 2n minus 2 sphere, and look at all tangent vectors to it. And that gives you the space, it's a model for the space of all oriented lines. Um, now, what you can do when we look at this, we can say, well, what happens uh, to the Euclidean group acting on this space? So, if you think the Euclidean group takes points to points, but then it also takes straight lines to straight lines. So, we could ask, uh, is there any invariant structures on the space of all oriented lines uh, which is preserved by this Euclidean group? That's the just uh, the theorem. Um, so this part here is myself Johann Klingenberg, and this is in code five. And in case for n equal to three, uh, what we prove is that there exists a Taylor structure, so I'll explain that in a second. Uh, it involves three things. It has a metric, G, uh, a symplectic form, uh, omega, which is a closed non-degenerate two-form, and it has a complex structure, J, which is like multiplication by I, with an integrability condition, and all of these want you want to fit together. That if you apply j to two vectors and then apply g, well, it's it's uh, invariant under j. So all of these structures have to fit together. All of these different uh, aspects fit together in a nice, simple way over the whole manifold. And what we proved is that there exists such a Kähler structure, uh, which is invariant under. So it's a, a big group, so it's, you wouldn't expect so many things, so many uh, such invariant structures to exist. But in fact, there exists one for n equal to three. Uh, it, what we also find, though, is that this uh, structure is somewhat unusual in that the signature of the metric G is two three. So it has two positive directions and two negative directions, eigen directions. Um, the other thing I guess that's kind of interesting about this metric, well, in some ways it's the, the connected, if you look at the isometry group of G, in fact the connected uh, component of the identity, that's, that's the same as Euclidean motions, the isometry group of all n. So not only is it invariant, but it actually has the same isomer group as the Euclidean group. So if you, you can think of this as a different representation, somehow the, the space of oriented lines carries with this the natural representation of the Euclidean group. Um, but I say the signature is 2, 2, which is one aspect of it which makes it rather strange. The other thing is that uh, this metric is not flat. Uh, it's conformally flat. Uh, So your clicking motions just are rotations and translations. So the Euclidean group. So it's a so, so the isometry group is the same. 
So uh, what I'm saying is this would say oh, okay. that the assignment group of this neutral metric is the same as the assignment group of the Euclidean group. So, ah, so okay. it's not just that the metric, in, that the assignment group includes the Euclidean group, which is what I mean here by saying it's uh, invariant. Uh, so the metric to be invariant under the Euclidean group would mean that these are motions. The Euclidean group preserves the metric, but the only motions, that, but the only things that preserve this metric are actually these motions. So these are exactly the same. Oh, okay. Um, but the Euclidean group preserves all the structures. So yes, the and, there, and it's the only group that preserves it all. There's no bigger group that, it, that preserves it. They're identical. Identical. Again, Euclidean motion. I'm leaving out uh, reflections. Okay, so again, I'm just sticking to the uh, connected component of the addition. Uh, okay, and the metric is. So, so, yeah? Sorry, so that means the assumption group for G yeah. uh, preserves, automatically preserves all of the. Exactly. Yes, it has every so it's actually more than that because it's all chaos. Yeah. Has everything in it. Has yes. Everything in it. yes, and it's and it, I mean it, it it has a lot of exceptional structure. I mean if you look at this the Euclidean group is the set of translations, uh, semi direct product with the rotations. And that's the that's the group if you want to write that. Um, so yeah, this metric contains. In fact, so originally when I started, when I came across this, and I explained in a second, I mean it's slightly unusual, but if uh, taken on space value, it says that you can do all of Euclidean geometry in the space of oriented lines in n equals three. Right, this is all n equals three. This. Um, the surprising thing is that it's conformally flat. Uh, it's scalar flat, so it has some of the curvatures as zero, but it's not flat. It's not not a flat metric. In fact, it's not Einstein. So the Ricci tensor. It's not, um, it's not a flat metric. So, okay, so it's a, it's a little bit weird. Instead of a, a metric, you know, the isometry group of a flat metric on, or, on a three manifold, and it's the same as the isometry group of a neutral metric on a four manifold. So there's no real obstruction to such a thing existing, but you, it's, not, it's some strange accident of low dimensions that this is true. Um, so, with that in fact, what happens in n not equal to 3, so subsequently, so um, if you don't look at 3, in fact, what you find is that this doesn't exist. This only exists in dimension 3. So, um, so this is Marcus Salvi, a few months after our paper, showed that, two, well, two things in fact. Uh, the first thing I would say is that uh, it, uh, there is no invariant metric. In the sense of what I'm talking about there. So, this only, the invariant metrics only exist, even just the metric, forget about the complex, just the metric, you're not going to get a metric uh, in the space of oriented lines of R4, or R5, and R6. And in the case for n equal to 3, it's unique. Uh, this metric is unique. Structure. Well, it's unique up to, up to addition of a spherical factor. There's no okay, Yes, for n not equal to 3, it doesn't exist, but for n equal to 3, it's pretty much unique. As I say, it's a slight habit, it's just up to addition of a factor. Now, the spherical factor from the sphere is actually what you add on. But in any event, even that gets fixed by a later restriction. But it's pretty much unique in dimension 3, and it doesn't exist in any, any other dimension. So this is something very uh, exceptional, and somehow, it suggests that, I mean, originally when we came across this metric, the signature 2-2, two, we ever, did everything to try and change it to make positive definite. <laughs> so I must have made a problem with the sign here somewhere. And then about six months later, there was this paper that said, no, in fact, this is the only invariant metric, so yeah, you can change the sign if you want, but it won't be invariant anymore. So somehow this is an essential ingredient of Euclidean geometry. You know, it's a different representation, and if you kind of think of this as a kind of correspondence between these two spaces, a lot of the problems that you could do in R3, you should be able to do in this TS2. Okay, so what I want to do now is just to talk about this metric, uh, in this situation at least, and see how does this metric, um, how can you see it, or what are the implications of such a metric. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to... Uh, sorry, Oh, S2, sorry, excuse me, yes, I 
which would be 3, 2, 4, yeah, TS2, so that should be, that's not 4, and let's see, mm, 2, 2, yes, you're right. So that should be 2N minus, 2N minus 4, I think. That's okay. right. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yes? Well, N equal to 3 will be going here, so we'll be looking at that. Thank you. Okay. Okay, so the idea then, really over the last few years that, that, that I've been pursuing is that you kind of have to take this 2 2 metric seriously. Uh, somehow, if you want to redo really things in this way, and there seems to be a natural way in which the Euclidean group and an exceptional way in which the Euclidean group can be represented in this way for all three, is that you somehow have to take these things, this metric seriously, because if, if this is to go anywhere, this, these metrics have to have some. Um, very important properties that somehow are translated back and there forward. And of course, the, the natural obstruction to thinking about that is because uh, the utility metric is flat and it's positive definite. I mean, this is not flat and it's not positive definite, so how could there be any relationship? Well, what we find, and I'll, what I'm going to talk about here, as I'll mention, uh, if you just took, look at classical surfaces, I'll show you exactly where the neutral metric appears in the uh, study of classical sur uh, surfaces, classical surface theory. Um, similar in a kind of, I'm going to talk a little bit about Legendre and knots and how some knot invariants are related to, well, the special cases of them at least can be constructed from this neutral matrix. And then at the end of that we'll think, oh well, so it's, it's kind of a way of re- interpreting or reimagining uh, uh, these different areas which have uh, arised in different places. But in fact, probably the most important aspect of the 2-2 metric which everybody is familiar is in fact the, what's called the ultra hyperbolic equation. And the ultra hyperbolic equation comes in every single day uh, in every hospital that makes a does a CAT scan. So CAT scans are all about the ultra-hyperbolic equation in some sense, and I'll explain that as we go. So I'm going to just talk about different aspects of this neutral metric and how you can see them in these three different settings, and how the metric uh, plays a subtle role. Um, so let me start just briefly with classical surface theory. So often you want to represent, I guess if you want to get a well unifying idea of what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and relate submanifolds of OR3 to submanifolds of TS2. And try and see the differential geometry of, indu of induced mappings between OR3 and um, set subsets in OR uh, in TS2, in space of oriented lines. And so, so the classical surface here I'm just thinking of nothing more than a smooth surface S. Uh, smooth, I'm going to take it to be oriented. I mean, it can just be a piece of a surface, oriented surface, uh, in R3. So we're just sitting in R3. And then the way in which we're going to link this to the space of oriented lines here is that, of course, if you have a point P, you have the tangent space, tangent space to the surface at the point P. And then orthogonal to that, you have the, or the normal. In fact, I'm going to think of it as a, a whole line, not just the direction, but I'm going to take it as... So this would be the oriented normal to the surface at the point P. And so maybe we'll call that down. I'll use for generic line, straight line, oriented, straight line. Um, okay, so if you look at this, of course, Every oriented line is a point in this four-dimensional space. So we have this four-dimensional space over here, TS2. So I'll write TS2, or L of OR3, the space of oriented lines for OR3, which I'll just call TS2 because of natural identification. And every point on this surface has an oriented normal, and every oriented normal gives you a point. So therefore, what you end up with here is a surface sigma, we call it, which is of oriented normals. These are the oriented normals to S. So here's down now will be just a point on that surface. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to try and go back and forward uh, a little bit between 
TS2 on the one hand, so OR3, and TS2. So, obviously, the way we've set this all up, the oriented lines here correspond to the points. So, an oriented line here corresponds to a point in TS2, that's the, what we've just set up. And then you could go the other way around and say, well, what, what could you represent a point in R3 by? So if you have a point in R3, what could you represent it in TS2 by? Well, again, simple and obvious thing to do would be all the lines that pass through the point, which means that this is a sphere. So you get a sphere in TS2. Now, these are going to be very special spheres in TS2. They're all, the, all the lines that go through a single point is going to be somehow geometrically special. In fact, these spheres, they're going to be uh, holomorphic. And by being homomorphic, I mean that J restricted to the tangent space of your surface of the sphere is going to be, uh, it maps, well, when you say J, which maps the four manifold to itself, takes the tangent space of the sphere to itself. So it means it's holomorphic. If you represent it by a function in the complex coordinates, it's going to be del bar is zero. It's going to be a holomorphic function. The other thing, is it's Lagrangian, uh, and being Lagrangian means that the symplectic form, which is this two form, pulled back to it is zero. So only get restricted to this sphere is zero. So that's what I mean by being Lagrangian. So this is one place in which you can see that this weird signature metric allows more variety than if you didn't have this positive definite, if, if you had a positive definite metric. Because a positive definite metric. If it's Kähler, holomorphic cannot be Lagrangian, Lagrangian, they can't be both at the same time. So this implies the degeneracy of the metric. In fact, the metric is degenerate everywhere on the sphere. So when you have a positive definite metric and you induce it on a nice surface, it's going to have a, a nice positive definite metric. But if you have an indefinite metric, you could have degeneracies, you can have different degrees of degeneracy, you can have singularities, etc. So there's much wider variety. And this is a situation where every point on this sphere, the metric is identically zero. So the metric is maximally degenerate on these. This is the worst it can get when it's both holomorphic and Lagrangian. Um, now, going back here, this picture here, catching up with this, if you take the whole surface here, S, you can look at the, the surface of normals, and again, so here you have a surface, S, and this gives you a surface sigma in this TS2. And again, it's quite, it, it's not any surface, uh, it's here, it's automatically Lagrangian. And in fact, if you go back the other way, a surface in TS2, if it's Lagrangian, well then the, it's normal to some surface. So this is kind of an if and only if. That if you have a surface in the space of oriented lines, so a two-parameter family of oriented lines, in order to have a surface orthogonal to it, you ha it has to be Lagrangian. And it's an if and only if. So this is for Bini's theorem. So that is, would be like integrability of a plane distribution of the perpendiculars to these lines. So being Lagrangian is equivalent to having a surface in or three to which all the lines that you're looking at are orthogonal. Um, and then... Sorry. Yeah. If I start um, yeah. with just a sphere about a point. Yes, it's a blind. Yeah. yeah. Then am I getting this sphere again? Yeah. So it's a sphere as well as that. Yeah. Okay. So if you here, if you take a point corresponding to a sphere, I mean you've just got a point P in R3, and you just look at all the orange lines that pass through this point. Just checking the Yeah, that's exactly. So you get a sphere worth. Yeah. So in that case, and this, obviously this is Lagrangian because it's perpendicular to, to a sphere of ra whatever radius you want about that point. Uh, and here, more, this is a more general statement that if you have any Lagra Lagrangian surface, then you have locally at least, you have an orthogonal surface to it. Right? So it generalizes in that sense. Gen usually they're not holomorphic as well. That's a much more restrictive condition than we get down to spheres or planes, in fact, in that case. Um, Okay, so what else do we have? Well, one of the things, and this was, I guess, what we originally used this for, or maybe not originally, but at some stage, we noticed that if you have, if this here, you have, another thing that you have on your surface here is you have its uh, curvatures. And when the curvatures are equal, you have an umbilic point, and it turns out that an umbilic point here corresponds to a complex point here. 
So this goes a little bit further. So if you have P on your surface, which is umbilic, and by umbilic we just mean that the two curvatures of the surface are equal to each other, which means they look a bit like spheres. Well, no surprise then when you see what's up there. Well, that means, again, that the normal through that point is a complex point. Uh, on your Lagrangian surface. Um, and again, complex just means that J preserves the tangent space. So, if you like, if, you're, if your surface is umbilic everywhere, well then it's going to have to be a sphere or a plane. That's, that's your well-known theorem. So this kind of goes between those two. An isolated umbilic point here will correspond to an isolated complex point over in TS2. Um, now, I guess this was, the, this was the way in which we reformulated Carr's theory conjecture about the number of umbilic points on a uh, surface in R3 in terms of the number of complex points on Lagrangian surface in TS2. So you get this complete equivalence between the two notions. In fact, we proved the theorem then by looking in this bigger four-dimensional space. Um, however, it goes a little bit further than that. This, if you like, uh, relationship between this metric over here. Now, here we just used individual pieces that would be used. This is Lagrangian, use holomorphic, but what about the metric? Well, it turns out any Lagrangian surface has to be Lorentz or degenerate, and it's degenerate when it's umbilic and it's Lorentz otherwise. So you have a natural Lorentz metric. So, in fact, when you take a surface here in, in R3, you can look at its curvatures, its lines of curvature of which it has a pair, right? So you have lines of curvature and surface, which tells you how it's bending. Well, in fact, the lines of curvature here are exactly the null curves on this Lorentz surface. Lines of curvature on S are the um, null curves. Um, so it's a Lorentz surface away from umbilic points. Again, that makes sense because at umbilic points you don't have them. your lines of curvature uh, have a singularity, so um, Lorentz as uh, so sigma. So the lines of curvature here, that's how you see the nullness of the metric in TS2. The nullness in the metric in TS2 is, uh, gives you exactly, it means that this, this metric induced here is Lorentz, so it has null directions. What are the null directions in R3? Oh, they're exactly the lines of curvature. Oh, exactly the lines of curvature. In, uh, in R3, on the surface of R3. Um, so, the lines of curvature just means where the curvature is constant? Uh, no, so if you look at, don't forget, if you have, what you look at here is the second fundamental form, which is a symmetric 2 by 2 tensor. Right, so, your second fundamental form is a symmetric uh, 2 by 2 matrix, if you like, then at a point, uh, and you can diagonalize it, and the eigenvalues are the uh, curvatures. And the eigendirections give you a direction at each point, and when you integrate them up, you get the lines of curvature. Okay. Right. So the lines of curvature are the eigendirections of the second fundamental form pieced together. I have to know. Um, the other thing, I mean, okay, so you start out at a level of points, and then you start looking at surfaces, and then at the level of derivatives, and you, you kind of drop a derivative in some way. Because um, curvature is, you think, the second derivative, whereas here, that's kind of the tilt of the tangent space, so it's kind of more like first derivative. So it's like when you go, you're going from surfaces here, or, or three, to the first derivative, some kind of geometrized first derivatives. These the oriented lines are giving you geometrized first derivative, in a sense. Um, so you kind of lose one derivative, but it relates different levels of derivatives. So the last one I'll, thing, I'll, again, I'll just show you in relationship, uh, goes further up to the next derivative, that it just keeps on going, which is that if you're in R3, if I can just complete it over here rather than start a whole new board, MTS2, sorry. Uh, if you take R3, so your surface S in this setting is uh, what's called Weingarten. So by being Weingarten, you just mean that there's some functional relationship between the two eigenvalues uh, K1 and K2 of the curvatures. Uh, one way to write that is to say that D of K1 wedge D of K2 is zero. And so that they're functionally, there's a functional relationship between K1 and K2, which 
between the eigenvalues of the second fundamental form or the curvatures, the principal curvature. So, for example, constant mean curvature, minimal surfaces, all of those are Weingarten surfaces because they have a relationship between the K1 and K2. Uh, and it turns out then that a surface is Weingarten, so it's the first the derivatives of the curvature. Uh, wedged together, if you like, are zero, if and only if, again, this is complete equivalence, if and only if the, this surface here has zero curvature, scalar curvature. It's only, it's only got one curvature because it's two dimensions, so it's Gauss curvature, but it's the induced curvature of the Lorentz metric as zero scalar curvature. Uh, using of the Lorentz metric. So having zero scalar curvature here has, means that it's fine art in, in TS2. Okay, so here, this is probably the most direct way of translating information in classical surface theory, or in R3, through classical surface theory, through to TS2, and seeing which a lot of the geometric things that you would look at, the standard paradigms in classical surface theory, umbilics, uh, convexity is another one I didn't mention, but it's to do with this being a section. Uh, being uh, have lines of curvature, all of these things are, can be expressed and reinterpreted in terms of this indefinite, you know, this neutral Kähler metric in the, in the background. And I'd say this was the main ingredient to transferring all of our information into TS2 for a proof of the Cartesian conjecture was precisely this. Okay, so <clears throat> as I spoke in a previous lecture about the Cartesian so let me move on to something slightly different. Um, so the second part of what I was I'm setting out to talk to you about is to discuss a slightly different construction because of course here the, the key thing I did there was just take a surface and replace it by its oriented normals and just look at the oriented normals and try and find what properties of the oriented normals can give you information to reconstruct the original surface or ge geometric properties of the surface. To work in the other direction, is, uh, I want to relate to the genre not theory. Um, and here again, I'm going to start with the definition. So the simplest, maybe I'll just take so so let S again be a surface in our string. Uh, it's a surface in our three. Um, and what we're going to define is H, which is all the lines, all the oriented lines, such that gamma is tangent rather than normal to S. So we're going to, instead of looking at all, this, all the lines that are normal to your surface, which was what we did a minute ago, we're going to look at all the lines that are tangent. So what we get there. So again, here you have some you have a piece of the surface, and then you're looking at all the lines that are tangent to your surface. Now, of course, it may intersect it further away if it's not convex and stuff. But anyway, just just think of that one little bit. Notice, uh, first of all, is that once you have one point here, obviously you can rotate it around the normal. So you kind of have a natural S1 action on this set. Right? So it's not immediately clear what this set is, but after a little bit of time, it's you can see it's going to be your surface cross S1 initially over an open set, but then maybe depending on the topology of the surface, if this was a closed convex surface. So maybe I'll do that. Maybe we'll just say let S be closed convex just for the time being. Because we can just say more, although it's easy enough to generalize this. So if it's closed and convex, this is going to be equal to an S1 bundle over S2. Uh, with a lot of characteristic two. Well, number two. Uh, and of course, it's, it's the unit tangent bundle to S2. That's also another way of thinking of the same thing, because you're taking every line, you're taking a line to represent just a unit vector, you know, at a point, and you're just looking at, if you like, this would just be the set of all unit vectors to S2. Right, so that's a three dimensional, right? So it's three dimensional space. Because every line, you can just take its direction and just say, oh, that's like a unit vector. If I give you the line and the point. Okay. So, yeah. Are we are we getting confused now? Mm -hmm. We're talking about the tangent. We have 
because our own... It's a different S2, it's just abstract. It shouldn't be a S2 yeah. is your yeah. surface. Yes. Yeah. No, 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 it's not. Yes, yeah, so, yeah. 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 yes, definitely. It's not. That's yeah. not the unit one with respect yeah. to symmetric on yeah. TS two. No, no. So we could even put that in brackets just to point out that that's. It's just the S one. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe just the S one will have your original surface. Uh, Which you call S. Yes. 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 Of course, it's going to prefer to call it S. Yes. In fact. It is really kind of the end of time in some sense, and you can scale all of the oriented lines can be gotten by just taking a sphere and looking at the tangents to the sphere and then just foliate. So you can actually foliate the full TS2 by this. <laughs> but again, that's not, it's not the normal way in which you think of the unit sphere bundle. So yeah, maybe we call it unit sphere bundle to S. Um, it's a three-dimensional. Okay, so let me just um, state just some, again, where does, the, where does this metric come into such a hypersurface. So this is a three-dimensional space in TS2. It's a hypersurface in TS2. So um, this is some work with Nicholas Georgiou and myself from 2016. So again, a few, some of the properties are very obvious, some of the more general are, are more difficult to extract, but I'll put them all down at once. Um, okay, so we know what the topology of the space is, so what, what is the metric on this? Well, it turns out that this hypersurface H is always null. It's a null hypersurface with respect to the metric. So I, its normal vector has zero length. Right? So it's normal. Again, normal in the 2 2 metric. We're now doing everything in TS2. Uh, it's normal. Uh, is has zero length, so it's self-orthogonal. Well, if it's self-orthogonal, then it lies in its own orthogonal complement, so it actually lies in the three-manifold. Right. So this is a typical problem in, in Lorentz pro problems. If you have a null vector, it lies in the subspace that you're, it's normal to. Okay. So okay. So this is so if this no, um, this normal so the normal lies in the tangent space to the to this hypersurface. Right. So again, at some the normal at a point at a line gamma actually lies in the tangent space to the hypersurface. Um, and what that means is that's a degenerate direction for the induced metric on the three surface. If you have a null hypersurface, it's going to have a degenerate metric on it. Right. The metric is going to be degenerate. Um, so, so, in fact, if you take the metric G and you restrict it to H, uh, if his signature is degenerate, it's 0, 1, 1. It's Lorentz degenerate. It's a Lorentz metric on a two-dimensional two subplane, and it's uh, degenerate in one, in one direction. Degenerate. So it's a Degenerate Lorentz metric on the three manifold. So again, this seems ah, that's very far beyond the kind of thing that you might work with because it's degenerate and it's Lorentz. Uh, but in fact, this has a very nice and simple structure. Um, if you look at this metric, it's not too hard to find out that the it has a Lorentz plane in some sense in our a Lorentz planes in there, but they kind of twist around. So well, the next thing I'll say is the following: is if we look at the null cone. So again, this is the three manifold we're looking at. Uh, the null cone restricted to G. Oh, sorry, G to H. Sorry, H. H. Um, what would, so all the all the zero vectors. Well, what what are they? They give you a pair of planes. So you have your normal, which is a degenerate direction, and there's a pair of null, a pair of totally null planes. So these are totally null planes. If you like, where is the Lorentz metric? If you take a cross section there, you have the null cone and the Lorentz metric, which is two straight lines, and then you have a degenerate direction. So you just move the whole thing in those two directions, and you get these two planes. Okay. Again, this is just a linear algebra. Purely linear algebra at a point. If you look at all the vectors that are zero, uh, you end up with this pair.
pair of planes. Now there are two uh, at each point. So you have a pair of planes at each point, transverse planes. Would just be all vectors whose length is zero. And it's in this um, in the degenerate metric. Yeah, but uh, sorry, what's the thing? The H is what. It's this set of all lines yes. okay. tangent to the. Okay, and if you rotate uh, um, this line around the normal, that's this direction here. You're just kind of rotates all the way around, and these planes rotate as you go around. So this is uh, it's, it's a quite complicated structure, but it's a structure nonetheless that you can understand and write down quite well. So <laughs> again, yes, again, we rotate the lines. So the so normal. maybe I'll come back up here. See, this is an S one bundle of rest two, yeah. and when you rotate, yes. that's your S one, right? Yes. That's exactly your normal direction. That's your normal direction up here. It's the tangents to the normal. That's your null curves generated by the normals. Okay. Right. So somehow the normals are generated precisely by this rotation, and they're totally de degenerate directions. They're null. Not only they're null, but any inner product of any other uh, tangent vector in that point is zero. So this is a degenerate direction. And then you could have other vectors, which, uh, like out here, which are null, but their inner product with other vectors is not zero. They're not degenerate metrics. And that gives you a pair of planes <laughs> at, the, at each point. And again, it, 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 it's a 0, 1, 1. That's, that's exactly what it's going to always look. Just purely linear algebra, this is what all the zero vectors are going to look like in that space. And again, where is the 1, 1, the Lorentz metric? Well, just any plane transverse to this will intersect on a pair of null, right? The two planes will, that's the null column of Lorentz surface, right? just two straight lines. Um, so, again, the, each of these, as I said here, this S1 bundle is a foliation, it's, it's foliated, so it's foliated by this normal, by null circles. These are the integral curves of the normal. Okay. Foliated by the null curves. And a little bit more than that, these planes, there's two of these planes, these types of planes. One is called an alpha plane, the other is called a beta plane. Uh, the alpha planes are holomorphic and Lagrangian, and the beta planes are neither. So there's kind of two flavors of plane even come out of it. Um, and what's more, these planes are not contact in the three, or sorry, are not integral in the three manifold. So, uh, foliate by null curve, uh, the alpha and the beta planes are contact. They give you contact on the H. And by contact, you mean you just, there's no orthogonal surface, there's no surface to which they're tangent. Maximal, maximally not in at any point. So in other words, they're twisting. As you move around this three manifold, these things are twisting in such a rotating in such a way that you can't find an orthogonal surface to in the three manifold. Right, so in other words, we now have this three manifold and it has a natural contact structure. It has a pair of natural contact structures on it. Um, it'll come back when we talk about the other hydraulic equation in a few minutes. In fact, that while they may, may not be, these planes, these two-dimensional planes, may not be uh, integral in the three-manifold, they may be integral in the four-manifold, because, of course, these alpha planes are at each point, and, you can, and it is, in fact, true. So, alpha and beta planes are integral in the four-manifold. So, when you're restricted to this three-dimensional manifold, are integral in uh, CS2. So in the bigger space, you can find a four. And in fact, they're important. So the tangents to the alpha planes, you might call alpha surfaces, and they're exactly, they're the normals, the spheres are, these are again the homomorphic Lagrangian spheres or planes. Normals, the spheres, the sphere or plane. So again, this CS2 is the it's T of tangent bundle of this surface. Uh, no, TS2 is the space of oriented lines. <laughs> Consider this, yes. Too many. When you're in small dimensions, you know, <laughs> there's too many different ways in which the same mathematical object can appear. 
So the alpha surfaces in the four manifold will be these spheres and planes, but obviously these, you can't have a whole sphere of lines sitting tangent to another sphere. That's, that's not possible. Right? So this is, in the four manifold, you can find a surface which is tangent to all these holomorphic Lagrangian planes. These are exactly the normals to the sphere of the plane. The beta surfaces, well, they're not holomorphic and they're not Lagrangian. So these, again, are ones that are tangent to these totally null planes that are not holomorphic Lagrangian. What the hell are they? They're actually... Well, they're the lines that live in a plane. So these are the oriented lines contained in a plane. In fact, if you want to think about that, that's the space of oriented lines of orchard. So the space of oriented lines of a two plane live inside naturally. <laughs> and these are actually beta surfaces. Right? And that's essentially, it is an OR cross S1 of those. You can have all the, an S1 in direction and then where you put it. Right? So you have an OR cross S1 there in terms of how much. So these are beta, these beta surfaces actually, yeah, they're kind, of, they're kind of strange, but they, it naturally shows you how kind of lower dimensional spaces are fitting into the, you know, the bigger dimensional spaces as you go up. Okay. okay, so let me now finally say, well, where I mentioned that this would be somehow related to knot theory, so let me just give you a very brief uh, indication of where that's the case. And again, what I, what I would say in some ways, the main paradigm that philosophically I've been trying to pursue is that you get a sequence of embeddings. That you try and look at subsets within subsets that are within bigger subsets, you know, and you slowly work it so that you can see what in how the various levels of the induced surface of the induced geometry uh, interact. So let me start then with the following. Again, we'll start off just very simply in R3. And we'll take, say, a closed convex surface. Only you can actually take a subset of it. Let's take the U which is a subset of your surface, just an open just a disk, just to make it easier for the picture. Eventually. And... Can we draw that S again? That we just Sorry, not S2. 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 That was a mistake, I should have been yes. And suppose we take a curve on this. So you have a U. Sorry. And you take some curves. So you've got a, a curve on a surface in a three manifold. So one manifold and a two manifold in a three manifold. And then in the four dimensional setting, it's TS2, we have the space of oriented lines, L of R3. So what do we have? Well, first of all, we have the set of all lines tangent to S. So you have H. This is a three manifold, so maybe I'll just kind of draw it like. This is H. It's a three manifold sitting in this four manifold. Right? And then for this line, what I'm going to, or for this curve, what we can do is take the tangent line to each line as you go around. Take the tangent line. So now we have a one parameter family in this. And if you look, it's all sitting inside U, and you have an S1 worth. So actually, if you just take this. Forget about the whole of S, and you just take, you have an S1 at each point, and you have a U worth, so you have a U cross S1 in here, which is just a torus, a solid torus, which is U cross S1. That's all the tangent lines just to U, just, right? just a piece of, just taking the cap. Right? So you have a U cross S1, and then this curve is going to be a curve in the solid torus. So, the tangent to C on S, or in U, it doesn't matter if U contained in S, gives you a curve in this solid torus. It turns out because of tangent, you could, not, you, you could choose the normal instead of the, ta instead of the uh, tangent to the curve. You kind of get a very similar picture. Well, this is going to correspond to a geometry in curve uh, on a null hypersurface.
Oh, sorry. The Legendre means that it's tangent to an alpha plane, right? Actually, that's a, it's a contact. So, being a Legendre curve in a contact structure, you have this plane at each point, and a Legendre curve is tangent to the plane. So, it has a certain degree of freedom at each point, it has a soul less one worth. But a Legendre curve here just means uh, tangent to your alpha plane. And that, that that's equivalent to being tangent. So, it's a null curve. These are null curves within this. Uh, in degenerate Lorentz metric. And in a situation like this, if you have um, Legendrian curves in a contact three manifold, then you have not invariance. You can write down invariance. It counts the amount of winding uh, that you do against this contact structure. So, in fact, what we end up then here is that we end up with these kind of classical not invariance for Legendrian knots. So, contact not invariance. And these are related to these neutral geometric, these neutral, because all of this is, is, makes reference to the induced metric, neutral geometric. Metric. So you can write down exactly the formula for how to integrate with respect to this metric to compute invariance of knots of various types. So I could do some examples, but may I won't get very far, but you can. Various types of knots, trefoil knots, etc. The only complication here is it's not in S3 or R3, which is usually where you see knots, and once you have knots with non in non simply connected uh, three manifolds, it gets more complicated to construct these things. But this just again sees a natural way in which these contact knot invariants can, in this case, can be given neutral geometric interpretation in terms of the rotation of the null cone of this metric. So you know, the knot is the, the curve in S3. In this here, yeah, it's kind of I sometimes call it a tangent knot because you're it's, you're taking the tangents to this curve and you get a knot here. Now, say you could take a normal if you wanted, then it wouldn't be Legendrian over here. Right? So you, there's, there's a way of going back and forth. But if you take the tangent one, for example, here, then you're going to get a in this three manifold. You, uh, with well, you're going to get, end up with the curve here, and this one has it has a contact structure. You see, you don't have any contact structure or anything mentioned at this point over here. So from that, then you can start getting invariance of the knots. And the, so it might count the number of times it rotates around here, right? The number, how tangled it is. Now, it, the fact that this is immersed, it has self-intersection because you're actually only tracking the normals. So in other words, this one goes that way, and this one they're different over here. So while it's immersed here, when you look at the tangents, it's embedded here. So you enter, so you could here you'd have to look at invariance of immersed knots, but here you have embedded knots and a contact structure, so you have more to actually compute that can distinguish between different knots up to Legendre and Isotope, as they call it. Okay, so again. In this setting, we've kind of gone, in the first part, what we did was we looked at all the normals to the surface, and then this part, what we've done is we looked at all the tangents to a given surface, and then try and relate the geometric properties of whatever's going on in R3 with this neutral metric, and see, although it's not as good as you would like, I mean, having a 0, 1 metric, 0, you know, 0, 1, 1 is not necessarily the best thing. However, it has enough structure to give you some uh, non-trivial information, so in this case, uh, for example, we'll be allowed you to uh, compute these kind of invariants and tell this knot here, this surface, this curve in R3 can't be perturbed to another curve in R3 because the knot invariants are different, for example. So you can distinguish between knot classes in certain uh, categories. Okay, the final one, and probably the one that kind of has an interesting history, which is this, uh, the last part of what I'm going to talk about. And we'll come back to these beta surfaces, and more of this will actually come back into this. What I just did here. So for the final part, I'm going to just mention this. Talk about the old hyperbolic equation. And here, let me let me talk about it uh, in a way by kind of talking about the, 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 where it comes up most frequently. Is as follows. So suppose we have some function f, I'll call it, which goes from r three to r. And the thing we want to think about, in fact, or plus usually, the thing I want to think about, think of it as like a density. It's kind of like a density of some sort. Um, so uh, generally I'll kind of prefer compactly supported, but again, it doesn't really matter. So here you're in R3 and you have some density here, and outside of that is zero. 
And what we want to do is we want to take a line, a gamma oriented line, and we want to construct a new function which goes from the space of oriented lines to all plus by u of a line is the integral of f over the line. So we integrate the function over the line. And any condition on this line, or this for all lines? Oh, for all lines. So we get a new function. Yeah. So you give. So if it misses the, you know, the area, then it's going to go to zero, and then you're going to just integrate up this. Now, this is exactly the basis of CAT scans, because what they do in CAT scans is they fire a ray in, and they measure the intensity going in, and they measure the intensity going out, and then they, the loss of the intensity allows you to give you an idea of what's happened, what the density is in here, and if you give me enough lines. I can reconstruct the density. Right? So that's the basis of CAT scans, is in fact to use this line transformer. Now, usually it's done uh, with the hypersurface as a kind of way you do it through planes. That's, you know, these cylinders are all, uh, you know, the CAT scan is cylindrical because they do it on planes, is what they do. But really they're firing rays on all the lines in a plane, in fact, is what they're using. Um, the question, though, you would naturally ask is, if I give you a function in or three, well, I'm sorry, on the space of oriented lines, when does it come from the integral of a function in uh, or three? So reverse it, right? So clearly, if I've got a function in or three, I get a function in TS2, and I want to know, so the question you can ask is, uh, when does such, does u come from an f? So I just give you a function that maps the space of oriented lines to R, and I want to know when does it come from a function f. Okay. Um, it's kind of an interesting fact that you know most of uh, in. They use the radon transform where you're really looking at the set of all planes in R3, which is a three-dimensional space. And because you're working in R3 and it's a three-dimensional space, everything fits together. When you look at the space of oriented lines, that's a four-dimensional space. There's, two, there's more dimensions in, in the four-dimensional space than the space of lines than there is in the space of planes. So there has to be some consistency relationship if it's going to come from the integral. That's the basic, uh, basic reason why. But the, the point is, that uh, the answer to this, now I will say, if you throw in compactly supported, this is true, but you could also have it with some asymptotics where it, as long as it falls off quick enough at infinity, blah, blah, and follow. So uh, let's just decide from fall off. This is just, you can, you can assume it as, say, compactly supported in TS2, so as you get you know, right to infinity in the space of oriented lines, you get eventually at zero, or you could have it as a fall off. Um, the answer to this is, uh, U comes from an F by integration, uh, if and only if the ultra hyperbolic uh, equation holds, which means the, which I'm writing as it's the Laplacian of this metric with signature two two is zero. And again, of course, what we're the class in here, I just mean you take your metric, take the second derivative, the covariant derivative, and trace with respect to this 2 2 metric. So there's your 2 2 metric. And this ultra hyperbolic, this is the ultra hyperbolic equation, UHG. UHG. And again, it, it's not exactly this, but you can. Change by a conformal factor, this will essentially be d2x1 squared plus d2x2 squared minus d2x3 squared minus d2x4 squared. And again, of u to 0. Now you'd have to change coordinates and get to get it into this form, you need to kind of but essentially, that's your ultra-hyperbolic equation. So again, it's exactly like the hyperbolic, equa hyperbolic equation. You'd have only one negative and three positive, for example. Uh, elliptic, this would all be positive. 
But this is plus, plus, minus, minus, so it's in between these two. It's like it has two times. Two, dimen two space dimensions, two time dimensions. Okay. Now, as I, there's a reason why this ultra but we, were, we said we wrote down this Taylor metric. Well, how come, surely that was known a long time ago, and the paper was in 2005 that I referred to. And I guess you could say, in some respects, the existence of this metric has always kind of been lurking around the background. People were aware of it, maybe not the fact that it, it was just one piece of a Kähler structure. But um, the experimentalists never use it because it's just a consistency condition on data. So they almost never use it. Um, it, it normally, they have the solution of the old hyperbolic equation. Why? Because the functions that they're writing down are exactly the integrals over functions in R3. So they have a solution. It's not like they have to go and solve this equation. But it is a consistency condition on their data, so they do use it to check consistency on their data, but they don't use it uh, as a way to solve anything. Um, on the other hand, rel uh, you know, relativists are well used to plus, 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 minus, you know, math pure mathematicians are well used to elliptic, but all positive, but this then falls between the cracks that the experimentalists don't use it, although it's there, and the theoreticians don't really, it's a kind of... And, I suppose the thing I would say from the point of view of PDE, so where does this sit within the pantheon of PDE? So if you have, say, plus, 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 you have elliptics. So you have your elliptic equations. Uh, and if you have elliptic equations, generally they're kind of, they're kind of rigid in some sense. You know, you have compact surfaces, compact manifolds with solutions of elliptic equations. You can tell certain conditions about them and you can, you know, there's lots of results that use the ellipticity of the equation to show that the solution must be just round or it must be this. So elliptic ones tend to be quite rigid. On the other hand, if you look at, say, Lorentz metrics, uh, so you have hyperbolic. Uh, if you have a hyperbolic problem, well, they tend to get singularities. So the natural thing is you end up getting focusing and you end up getting singularities. So this is just something you can't avoid. And they can, the singularities can be pretty much as bad as you can. Um, as you can see. So for elliptic equations, they can be quite rigid. Uh, hyperbolic equations, well, they, again, these are quite general statements to make, but generally singularities cannot be avoided unless you have some regimes where you can really control things. And the point is that the ultra-hyperbolic is exactly in between these two. This ultra-hyperbolic equation, it's not as rigid as an elliptic equation, but it behaves better than a hyperbolic equation. So this is one of the reasons that I've started looking at this kind of more seriously, is because it can do things with the, it can do things with the ultra hyperbolic equations that you can't do with elliptic equations because either the solutions are trivial because of rigidity, or, sing, or if you use a hyperbolic equation, then it's not as well behaved. You're going to end up with, with singularities. Um, so there are various uh, ways in which um, I'm working with uh, one of my students, uh, with Guillaume uh, Cobos, to study solutions to these equations. There's some, invariant, some interesting um, paper, uh, work from the 30s by Fritz John on this equation. Um, like this equation got a very bad rap because Courant Hilbert in one of them in their books actually gave it as an example of an ill-posed initial value problem. So they said, look, yeah, you can just give it on a three-manifold and then have, expect to have some natural, with some constra simple constraints in order to propagate it. This equation doesn't work. And they gave a, a, an example of it. So it kind of got a bad rap as, oh, this is a bad one. But Chris John then in the 30s came back and said, no, no, hang on, this does arise in the context of the space of oriented lines, although he never uses that terminology or the kinematic. And he says, no, no, it's more interesting than that. And it can be well posed if you do this. And so then in their later editions, they included his to say, but still, in any event, as a metric, it's not, it, these things are, are not studied as much as either of the other two cases. So let me just end with just two simple identities. So again, I'm trying to point out what is it in R3 geometrically that you can capture or you can re uh, reinterpret in terms of this geometry in TS2. So let me give you just two identities. But again, two identities that, again, encapsulate something of the relationship between these two um, geometric structures. So again, I'm taking, you've got a function, the setup is the same as I have here. It's a function from R3 to R, and then you have U, which is the integral over lines. Over, so as a function on the space of oriented lines. So the first identity is the following, is that if you take your function 
and you integrate it over the whole of R3. Um, but this is exactly 1 over 4 pi times the integral of u over, over ps2. So What's this D4B? This is the four volume associated with the metric G, with the neutral metric. So here's your neutral metric, here's your Euclidean metric. What is it? it and you can associate a volume form with the neutral? Yeah, neutral metric. As a no, but don't forget, the neutral metric, it has a bad signature, but so what? As a man, it's, it's in, you know, it's invertible, it uh, has all the nice, but as a format, okay, when you look at trying inducing it on lower dimensional spaces, you get degeneracies and your area forms and volume forms can be zero, but at the level of the four manifold, it's got a perfectly well-defined volume form, it's never zero at any point, and you can, so the integral here, uh, so how, how could you see, <laughs> this is kind of a very straightforward thing, in fact, if you wanted to integrate f over all of R3, what you do is you pick a direction and look at all the lines in that direction. And now you can integrate along each line, which gives you u, and then you integrate over the whole of the, right, the two, the plane, all these lines. And then you have a whole S2 worth. But it's equal, it doesn't matter which, S2, which direction you choose. If you integrate over the whole space, it doesn't matter whether you integrate it over all the lines in this direction or in this direction. So if you integrate over all lines, you just pick up a whole S2 factor. And that's your S2 factor. That's the area of, of, of S2. So I get 1 over 4 pi there. Um, and the other one, suppose you have just a regular plane, a flat plane in R3. So these are the kind of things that are used in the radon transform. And in the radon transform, what you do is you take your function f and you integrate it. Again, this is the area form with respect to the Euclidean metric. And you integrate it over a plane, over an R2. Okay, well this works out to be 1 over 2 pi, which is the area of the 1, S1, <laughs> uh, okay, the length of S1, of the integral of U uh, integrated over the beta plane associated with the R2. So remember the beta plane was the set of all lines that are contained in a plane. So this is L of R2, space oriented lines in the 2 plane. And again, you're getting a redundancy because you've got a whole S1 where you can pick a direction and you can rule the plane by any given lines in a given direction. So you have an S1 worth, and it doesn't matter what you choose. So if you do the full integral, that's 1 over 2 pi. The question is, what's the volume form? What's the form here? Now you want a non-degenerate form. It turns out that it's exactly the symplectic form. Uh, because these, these planes are never Lagrangian. <laughs> They're symplectic. So, so this is the symplectic 2 form. So you can integrate over a two form, and your symplectic structure comes in there. Sorry, in, in this idea, so you have this f and u that is equal to the integral, integral of f over that gamma, gamma over a line. Is specific. In any line. So you've got a function from R3 to R, then it defines a function from TS2, from the space of all lines, into R by integrating over the given line. So sorry, you can think of this as an argument. U of gamma is the symbol of gamma. Yeah. So whatever. So now you can integrate this U as a function on uh, TS2. So you can here you integrate it over the whole of TS2, and here you just integrate it over a beta surface. Right? If you integrate it over a beta surface, right? This is your beta surface associated with it, which is all the. Right? And again, if it is these two null planes, one of them was Lagrangian holomorphic and the other one was not Lagrangian and not holomorphic, so the symplectic form is never zero on a beta surface, and this is why it gives you a good area form. But it's exactly the geometric area form that you need in order to relate those. So here you have the area of S2, and here you have the length of S1. <laughs> right, so as you go through something like that. And do you have anything about alpha planes? <laughs> well, the alpha planes, uh, yeah, the alpha planes, we know them, they're the planes that are normal to a sphere or a plane. Right. Okay. 
Yes, the, the, nor the alpha planes are Lagrangian, so they have an orthogonal surface, and they're holomorphic. And holomorphic, remember, means a complex at every point, so therefore the two eigenvalues are equal. So if the two eigen eigenvalues are non-zero and equal, you get a sphere. If the two eigenvalues are equal and zero, then it's plane. Right. So you know what the alpha planes are. Uh, I, you can't really integrate over these alpha surfaces. That, well, you could on a plane, but over a sphere, because you get a volume form and you, you, you get some extra form. You know, when you integrate over U, it's kind of through a factorization of the integrals, really. You can't do it if the plane. It's okay when the planes are all parallel, then everything kind of becomes a product. Yeah, so, but there you have. So, if you like, if you integrate over OR, you get this U. <laughs> Because right? you're integrating over all the a single line in R3. If you integrate over R2, then you get this, in this double integral of U over a beta plane. And if you integrate over the whole of R3, it's the integral over the whole of the space of oriented lines. Again, the volume form is exactly the volume form right, of the form metric, of the neutral metric. So, okay, but that is at least hopefully you can see it. You, a lot of the, again, the idea is to try and re-encapsulate re um, geometry in R3 and the various, again, with respect to this neutral metric, despite the fact that it doesn't, it's not within the pantheon of what we would normally consider for metrics. Oh, yes. So one way to think about it, if you have a, well, think about a Lorentz metric, it would be 1, minus 1, 1, minus 1. Okay, so now up here, let's go u plus v and u minus v, if you like, change it. So this is all equivalent to 1, 1, 0. Yeah, okay. okay. Yeah. And now suppose you take your coordinate x1 equals constant. Or just to say this. So what are you going to get? You're going to get 0, 1, minus 1. That's, that's the induced metric. Right. So this x, x1 equals constant is null because it was u plus v and u was 1 and v was minus 1 so they add up to 0. So this, if x equals constant, this is a null hypersurface and there's the induced metric and it's degenerate Lorentz. Okay. So now you can ask, look at this here and say, okay, let's, let's start with this, forget about where that came from, let's just, what would this look like at a point? What's the, obviously the metric is degenerate, it has a direction which is zero you know, when inner product with itself and every other vector. If you forget about that direction for the moment and you look at two other directions, you would have a plane like this, and this is the Lorentz metric, so therefore it's null cone would just be, right, that's just null directions at each point. And then you also have a direction now, this direction, which is zero to everything. So you now go transverse to this, and you'll get two planes. Then I have to redraw this. So you've got your Lorentz plane, and then you have a direction that's orthogonal to everything, including itself, so you get all these degenerate. So this is your degenerate direction, and this plane, or this null line, and this null line now cross with this vector is going to give you a totally degenerate. So the metric is completely zero on this plane, and it's completely zero on that plane. And that's your alpha. So, sorry, just mm -hmm. earlier on when you said the signature on uh, G, G restricted to this H. Yes. It's zero, zero, one, one? Is that zero? Oh, yeah, it's zero, one, one, one minus one, I should have said. Yeah, yeah, so it's zero plus minus. Yeah, zero, one, and one. So that would, it's uh, degenerate Lorentz, so it's exactly like this. And you can see that if you have degenerate Lorentz, you want to look at all the vectors whose lengths are zero. You have the null vectors in the plane, and then you can also cross it with this OR, because it's degenerate in that direction. So they're all going to be zero after that. 
Um, and this is the, so this is the null cone, if you like, of an, on an, any null hypersurface, because this is a generic kind of picture for any null hypersurface. You get this kind of thing in a Lorentz, sorry, in a, an indefinite metric, sorry, in a neutral metric. If you had Lorentz, it would be 0, 1, 1, for example, you could have, right? Because you'd have the 1 and the minus 1, and you get rid of it, and that would be 1 and a plus 1, right? So in a Lorentz metric, a null hypersurface is degenerate. Um, definite plus plus. Whereas in an in a neutral metric, a null hypersurface is degenerate Lorentz. <laughs> so you have this extra cone structure here. It's different to the, to the Lorentz case. Thank you. All right. So I can just. Uh, just very, I mean, this kind of transform geometry and so mm -hmm. on, so I, I mean, I know nothing about it. Mm -hmm. I know that these kinds of things occur in, in uh, Gelfand and the students and so on. That's right, yeah. I mean, is, is this connected to that? Yeah, in general, what they would do is with these transforms, the radon transform and the inverse radon transform, uh, they all look at where you know the integral over hypersurfaces. Whereas here, we're, so there's no integrability condition. Yeah. So this is, that's the, so, I mean, you could argue that in 1975, McCormick got the Nobel Prize for showing that you could reduce the four-dimensional uh, ultra-hyperbolic, uh, the X-ray transform, to the radon transform. And this was already done in the 30s, and he claimed he didn't know about it, but of course, no, no doubt he didn't. But, uh, in fact, what, it's much easier to work with hypersurfaces. So generally, Gelfand and all these guys, but they work with where you have, you know it's integral over a hypersurface, and so there's no integrability condition, and then it's a question of inverting it, and you can invert it in different ways, and then they have broken versions of it where you know your, ray, your rays are not um, straight, but they're allowed to bounce, etc., etc. So that's usually the kickoff of that. But in general, what you're trying to do in, in those, the main tool is integral, integrating over hypersurfaces, which is the radium transfer. So here, this is the for its, the John transform, it's called, or the X-ray transform, and it's it's really the basis on which you know the the radon transform can be built up. But it involves this extra integrability condition, and because it's nice, it doesn't fall into a nice class of PDE. People don't t tend to look at it so much for that reason. Yeah. Okay, thank you very right. much.